Center in Houston, Texas. And when I lived in Houston, I had the pleasure of going to the, the Jung Center there. However, I didn't meet Dr. Hollis until here in, in San Diego, and we've had the joy of having him here in the past. He has authored a number of books, numerous articles. He has lectured nationally and internationally. And this evening, he's going to be sharing with us concerning his most recent work, Creating a Life, uh, on this journey we call our life. And so let us warmly welcome Dr. James Hollis. Thank you very much. I was here, I think, about three and a half years ago, something like that. And uh, I sneezed and wheezed and so forth and found out later that when I got back to Houston, I had pneumonia and a serious case of it. So uh, uh, I'm happy to be here, happy to be germ-free tonight. Uh, the subject this evening is a very complex subject, creating a life. And it really is a question, can we and in what fashion? Tomorrow's workshop, even though it begins at 8, I think will be worth your time because what I'm wanting, be wanting to do is present some ideas to you that will help lift to the surface some um, of the interior patterns that are frequent uh, shadow governors or um, uh, influences in the choices we make. And um, if, if they operate unconsciously, and then of course we have no way of knowing their influence in our life. So the key is to try to bring some of these things to consciousness. I think you need to feel non-threatened by this. Nobody will be called upon. But I would like you to bring, if you will, uh, a notebook or something to write on because we'll be doing a little uh, question and answer journaling response to the questions tomorrow. In thinking about creating a life, it reminds me of uh, two fellows that grew up outside of London many years ago. And they were always rivals as children. And uh, each thought that he could create a life that was more profound than the other. And so that rivalry continued into their later life. And one, when he grew up, chose to uh, serve the queen in her navy. And one, when he grew up, chose to serve the queen in her church. And in time, the former became a rear admiral of the fleet, and the latter became the Archbishop of Canterbury. They hadn't seen each other for many years, given the calls of their various duties and just happened to meet in Paddington Station. And the churchman crept up behind his old friend, clad in his regalia, tapped him on the shoulder, and said uh, to him, uh, Porter, Porter, um, can you tell me the time for the next train to Manchester? And the admiral turned around and without missing a beat and said, no, I cannot, madam. Well, but I think, I think a lady in your condition shouldn't be traveling at all. So. So in a way, they created a life. But um, what does it mean to create a life? Can we? And I think the answer is yes and no. Typical Jungian answer. Um, when we think about creating a life, we recognize that our chief fantasy is a heroic fantasy. It's the ego's fantasy of its own sovereignty, of being in control, being in charge, being on top of the situation. And we find ourselves pursuing uh, throughout our life all sorts of things. And, and what is it we're pursuing? God, a home, love, security. Um, there's a Navajo phrase, the chindi, means the hungry ghosts. And paradoxically, my own analyst in Zurich many years ago used the identical metaphor without knowing the Navajo word. And he said, without disrespect, he said, you Americans are masters of the outer world. But he said, as for the inner world, he said, you're all like hungry ghosts covering the earth, but in search of who knows what. And so the question then is, can we create a life? And if so, how, how and in what ways? Because the truth is, the more we look at our lives, the more we see their repetitions. The more we see we've stumbled on things. The old French proverb, the more things change, the more they stay the same, seems to speak to each of us. And why is it that relationships turn out in the same old ways? And why is it that so many times that there are certain recurrent issues that pop up in different cities and different venues and different relationships of our lives? And we have to confess that the only person who's been consistently present in every scene of that drama we call our life has been ourselves. 
therefore, it might seem to, to come to reason that um, we have some responsibility for how things are turning out. Now, one of the reasons there are so many repetitions in our lives is because there are very large core ideas that we carry within us. By core ideas, I mean they have to do with our fundamental sense of self, sense of world, and how we relate to each other. And in many cases, those core ideas were absorbed, internalized. In some cases, they're misinterpretations of reality. But they typically come at a time when we are most vulnerable, most permeable, least capable of comparative analysis, least capable of rational reflection, namely in childhood. And, and also we absorb other patterns and attitudes and behaviors and notions from our culture itself. And so much of what we would not recognize as a kind of autonomous set of ideas within us are actually acquired. And they are not inherent to who we are. You know, Freud said uh, that the price of civilization is neurosis. And what he meant by that is from the moment of our birth on, we are obliged to be in service to multiple agendas. There's the internal and extinctual uh, agenda, and there is also the agenda of one's culture. And each one has a very large claim upon us. As long as those unconscious ideas are running their programs without our being aware of them. They have a tendency to dominate our lives, make our choices for us, and create those patterns. As a matter of fact, when there are unconscious ideas, and there are always unconscious ideas, there are three things that can happen. The most common, by far, is repetition. It would be a tendency to repeat whatever the script of that particular idea implies. Or secondly, there may be something in us that intuits, intimates, its presence and seeks to go in another direction. I'll be anything but like my mother, or I'll choose differently than my father. And every time we say this or are acting on such a premise, we're still being defined by that, even if we're trying to be this over here. Or thirdly, we may unconsciously typically uh, develop some sort of um, treatment plan for whatever that idea is all about. A treatment plan could be anything from an addiction to choosing one's profession and specializing in that particular area. Or if you're truly troubled, you might become a therapist and try to fix it in someone else. So we realize that, that these, these ideas are at work within us all the time. And I, that's one of the things I'll be trying to talk about more tomorrow in our workshop. But I remember particularly seeing, knowing a family some years ago in which the father was a very controlling authoritarian cleric, had three children. His eldest son became a cleric and adopted his father's personality. His brother, the second child, went as far in the other direction as he could. He literally became a gun-toning DEA agent, who kind of liked to really break into a crack house with gun, gun ablaze, as getting as far away from his father as he could imagine. And, and the third was the daughter, who became first a nurse and then later a therapist. So she was always trying to treat this issue. So I realized I could see in a single family all three of those reactive patterns present to what was essentially a climate of opinion, a context, a, a set of implicate ideas that are internalized by the child. Now, nothing I'm saying this evening is truly original with me. It was intuited centuries ago in other cultures. In particular, in the Greek imagination, one sees that they intuited that there are forces at work in the development of personal history over which we have no knowledge, but which are playing out nonetheless. And those forces are at work in history as well. And th those forces were not the gods as such, but they were nonetheless energies or powers. For example, Mira or fate. Um, another one was DK or justice. Another one was Safrosune, which is the principle of balancing, that what goes around comes around. Another one was Nexus, which we might see as consequences or retribution. And even character came from a word that meant markings, as on a slate. So character, it too, was something that was drawn there, as it were, from the beginning, and, and affected things. And all of those forces were at work continuously in the life of the individual. 
And on the other hand, there was another energy that they called proeurismos, which we would translate as destiny. And the etymology of that word meant to flow within the relative boundaries of something that's been set out, like a, a river flowing through its, its banks. It can change its course, but it's also there to carry out you know, its own project. So if you throw all those forces together, that fate at one end, the givens, that we, we simply are presented by the gods, the family of origin, the culture into which we're born, our genetic inheritance, none of this is our choice. And, and yet a certain destiny, a certain nature that seeks to carry out its own path, to express itself. But right there in the center is human character. And in character, there were certain other characteristics, one of which was hubris, which is a tendency towards presumption. The presumption the ego makes frequently, namely, I know who I am. I, I'm in charge here. I'm running the show here. There's a certain tendency of the ego to privilege its own position, to value its own choices. The problem with the ego at times, we need one, but part of the problem is it often doesn't know enough to know that it doesn't know enough. And so they recognized that it was somehow the interplay of all of those given forces and elements of human character that profound wounded me was, the, excuse me, the fate that wounded me was Apollo, but the hand that wounded me was my own. And you can sense there the tension and the respect that he's come to, to accord to both of these forces. Now in the end, we are, in a certain way, creatures of these core ideas. And of course, what we don't know does hurt us. The one thing that no one in good faith could answer tonight is, tell me now, what are you unconscious? Because by definition, we don't know. And what is unconscious is probably making choices for us. Now, when we ask ourselves, what is unconscious? What, what are the elements, the values, the internalized experiences which are making choices? We can only begin to get some sense of them when we reflect, reflect, first of all, on our life patterns. After a certain age, you begin to say, well, there are patterns in my life. And you don't wake up in the morning and, and say to yourself while you're brushing your teeth, well, I think I'll do the same stupid thing today. <laughs> but we have a tendency to do that. Uh, and then you have to ask, well, what is it that's producing patterns in my life? And that's a critical clue as to the presence of those unconscious core ideas, that where patterns are, they are in service to an unconscious idea. And even when we make it conscious, it has an enormous staying power. We just can't will it away. It has a, a, a kind of history attached to it, a large energy. That means that consciousness alone is not sufficient to banish it. All consciousness can do is begin to recognize its presence recognize that it might be a player in the conduct of our lives. And that's the beginning of humility, and humility is the beginning of wisdom. We certainly can look at our dreams, because we don't know where dreams come from. Yet, nature never seems to waste energy, and we average six dreams per night every night. That's a lot of activity. And the dreams seem to be coming from a, a place, from a, an energy center, outside the sphere of consciousness. And if you think it's within the range of consciousness, try to order up a certain kind of dream. See if the unconscious pays any attention to you. It, it won't. And yet, if one tracks them with a certain systematic discipline, one... And if you're married, as I happen to be, speak to your spouse, who'll be happy to tell you everything you need to know about yourself. So in these painstaking and often humbling ways, we begin to get a sense that there are other forces at work in the conduct of our lives. Perhaps this evening you thought in attending a lecture on creating a life, you would get some easy lessons on how to make your relationship work and how to get the right career and that sort of thing. It's actually 
a very sobering thing to stop and reflect upon how intricate the nexus of cause and effect is within each of us. And, and you know, if you think the window of consciousness is narrow, simply don't try to make the effort to ask these sorts of questions. And you see it narrows completely. And at that point, you begin to realize that the consciousness we're talking about is one that has to be part of a discipline throughout the course of one's life. What's going on here? Where does this come from in my history? Where have I been here before? What does this hit in me? What does this reaction indicate that it's in service to? Those are continuing questions that the ego at times, frankly, would rather not pay attention to. It's a lot of work. But it's the beginning of discerning what some of those unconscious ideas are in one's life. I think also that if you reflect on how life is being lived, in many cases, we live our lives every day in response to certain questions. Those questions may not be our questions. They may be the questions we grew up with, the questions that were implicit in our family of origin or in our culture. Um, when I was a child, for example, a question I heard almost every day is what will people think? And I know that that inculcated itself very deeply into the structure of my being. And only in later years did I begin to realize if, if that was the kind of question my life was wrapped around, then I would be forced like a chameleon into adaptive positions on a daily basis. And that I would cease to live a life of integrity. I'm not blaming anyone for that question. I'm simply saying that's the kind of question that you can find in the family of origin. How can I be secure? No, that's not a federal crime to have that question. And yet if, again, our life is wrapped around that question, you realize it will never be developmental because all development means taking us into places that we haven't traveled to before. And therefore, there's an inherent insecurity. The, the, the most developmental aspects of our life will precisely move us out of the security zone. How do I avoid growing up? How do I find someone to take care of me? See, for the child, these are absolutely understandable and natural questions. But our, our personality structure, our, our behaviors and attitudes can be identified with those questions in such fashion that we're, we're living not only in some sort of uh, fallacious way with our own destiny, with our own nature, but also not living in integrity with other people. And you can realize then, all right, if, if those questions are, are not worthy questions and are not developmental questions, what kinds of questions are? So I thought I might share with you seven questions I think that are useful to reflect upon in the conduct of one's life. The first I've already talked about, and tomorrow's workshop will be devoted to this, what are those autonomous mythological fragments when I use the word mythology here, it's, a, it's not a negative word, it's a, it's a very uh, positive word. It's like a charged cluster of energy that's value-laden and has a, ha has a capacity to come up and usurp consciousness and bring our energies in service to it. You know, what are the autonomous mythological truths which are living my life? Or which, another way of putting that, are, which are living me? Another question is how am I, or in what way am I called upon to use my energy at this point in my life? Now that question and that answer will vary de determining the stage of our life and the outer circumstances. But many times I think one can recognize upon reflection that one's use of energy is really in service to an old agenda that's the chief cause of the so-called neurosis. It's pumping energy into an old value system at a time when the natural developmental task of the individual has already uh, exhausted that set of strategies and behaviors and uh, has begun to express itself symptomatically. In the second half of life, there is a different question in the first half of life. In the first half of life, the question is, what is the world asking of me? 
and can I mobilize the resources to meet the world's demands? To deal with my parents, to deal with my school teacher, to deal with the employer, to deal with relationship. Those are appropriate developmental tasks of the first half of life. But our culture treats us as if it ends at that point. What is the world asking of me? And we spend our life trying to meet its demands. Second half of life, you realize you pay a price for that living that question alone. Second half of life, the question has to become, what is the, the soul asking of me? Now remember, the word soul is, is the literal translation of the Greek word psyche, suke. And so the soul has to do with the inherent purposefulness of the organism that may have very little to do with the desires of the ego for its own comfort, participation in community, satiety, and so forth. That the ego is, is a necessary tool for consciousness. It got you here in the right evening and the right time and place and so forth. That's very useful. But it can also be an impediment. What is the soul asking of consciousness? It's a different agenda. And how can I give energy to that? When, when that question is asked and consciousness responds, there is a, a, a shift in the conduct of one's life. Life deepens, it becomes more mysterious, perhaps scary, perhaps um, obscure to others, but it takes on an inner truth or lives an inner truth, which you feel is a kind of inherent validation of your choices. A third question is by what spiritual points of reference am I making my choices? By spiritual points of reference, I mean what values are transcendent to those of your culture, transcendent to those of the conduct of ordinary life, which seem nonetheless to summon you. Uh, there was a time when Admiral Byrd was in great peril in the South Pole and was convinced that he was going to die. And he was 100 miles from the, the nearest rescue party. And he wrote about his life in his journal hoping that it might be found when they found his body. And he wrote with a great deal of insight, acceptance, and equanimity. And the question then is, what does it take at the end of our lives to examine how we've conducted it with acceptance, insight, and equanimity? And I think the answer is really two things. One is you have to feel you live your life and not someone else's. And secondly, that you had some relationship to values which were transcendent to you. Now, those values could be of nature, of your work, of relationship, um, to traditional spirituality. That's not important here, but that one has a sense of linkage to an order of meaning larger than the artifacts of culture around us. So the third question is, by what spiritual points of reference are you making your life's decisions? The central characteristic of modernism is the erosion of the tribal mythologies that guided people in the past and linked them to the four orders of mystery, the cosmos, nature, the tribe, and each other, um, and the erosion of the powers of institutional life, church and government. And so the task of meaning has progressively over the last 200 years shifted from sacred tradition and institution to the shoulders of the individual. And therefore this question by what spiritual points of reference is critical because they provide the mythological longitudes and latitudes by which one has a sense of place, sense of spiritual locus and a potential for choice. Fourth question may sound strange, but what's the useful fiction that I've adopted for this stage of my life? Now, the word fiction here doesn't mean um, untruth. It comes from the Latin verb facere, it means to make, as in fabrication, factory. So by, by what construct, whether you believe it to be ultimately validated by yourself or others, but by what construct do you find meaning and purpose and direction in your life. An example, Siren Kierkegaard, the Danish theologian of the 19th century, writes this about Socrates. He said, Socrates could not prove the immortality of the soul, 
he simply said, this matter occupies me so much that I will order my life as though immortality were a fact. Should there be none, ABN, I still do not regret my choice, for this is the only thing that concerns me. According to Kierkegaard, Socrates had found his useful fiction. Part of my useful fiction is invested in the notion of therapy and education. That, that whether it has any ultimate cosmic effect, I haven't a clue, but I know that it's inherently rewarding and brings me into relationship to worthy questions and worthy individuals asking those questions. So that's a, a useful fiction for me. Another question is by what authorities are you living your life? Or, or what are the authorities you, you really uh, check in with? Because if that's not a conscious choice, trust me, the authorities will be those old autonomous ideas, the complexes. Um, and we all have a certain tendency to flee the question of personal authority because we all had one basic existential message and we had it the same, namely, the world's big and you're not. The world's powerful and you're not. Now, adjust yourself to those facts. And so the notion of authority is invested in what is large and external. And the more we're in service to that which is large and external, the more we can get away from the internal process that we're here for, in my view. Um, as a, so for, as a result of that, the large itself can scare us. Jung said once in a wonderful metaphor, he said, we all walk in shoes too small for us. And you know what he means by that. We all walk in shoes too small for us. For this reason, a person could go to school in order to avoid education, because education produces change, a real choice. A person can attend a house of worship in order to avoid religious experience. You know, don't ask for a religious experience, you might get one. And, and you're thrown into a different frame of reference. A person can even go to therapy to avoid the reality of the psyche. Hey, I go to therapy every week, I follow my dreams, I'm on top of this. There's the ego again trying to reassert its position. So the question of, of authority to me is a critical question. A few years ago we had a conference, the Jung Center and the Medical uh, Center in Houston. One of the questions we asked people to reflect upon, these were surgeons and therapists and clerics and others, by what authority do you really do your work? We don't mean a piece of paper on the wall, a, a title on the door. We're talking about a learned personal relationship to your experience that constitutes your authority. Jung wrote, understandable um, assumption. But that's not what it's about. Jung says it's better to renounce any attempt to give a direction and simply try to throw into relief everything that the analysis brings to light so that the person can begin to see it clearly for himself. Anything he has not acquired himself, he will not believe in the long run. And what he takes over from the authority merely keeps him infantile. The person should rather be put in a position to take it that there's a possibility of acknowledging the, um, the powers that the gods have over us. If I ask this question myself, I've come up in recent years with a kind of metaphor. The god I've been serving, this wasn't intentional, but de facto, has been Hermes. Hermes is a god of the in-betweens. Now that's a strange thing. That's not a job category the IRS would recognize. You know, I, I work in between, right? But I, I, as a teacher, I work between the material and the student, as a writer, between the material and the, the reader, uh, as a therapist between the material and the person having a dream, let's say. And it's a strange place to be there in the in the in-between. And yet I've come to realize that's what the gods chose. It's not what my ego chose. My ego resisted that, fled it, and was dragged back kicking and screaming in the second half of life to take on this task of being in the in-between. And I still haven't figured out what it's about. 
I just know that it has its own inherent meaning, and I experience that all the time. A seventh question is, what is truly my vocation? Now remember the word vocation comes from the Latin vocatus, vocal, to be called. Too often our culture has um, debased that question into what's your job or your career. The job is how you pay your bills. Vocation is what you're called to do as a person, your, your calling, and it will, it will change as, as we develop. Jung writes, vocation is an irrational factor that summons us from the herd and from the well-worn path. True personality, and he means personhood, not being miscongeniality, he means personhood, is always a vocation, despite often it's only seeming like a personal feeling. Vocation acts like a law of God from which there is no escape. The fact that many who go their own way end in ruin means nothing to one who has a vocation. Each of us must obey this law as if it were a daimon, a tutelary spirit whispering to us of new paths. Anyone with a vocation hears the voice of the inner person. Such a person is called. Now, a number of years ago, I was talking on another subject, and, and a lady said to me, <clears throat> why should I think about these things? And I said, well, and it was another subject than this one, if, if you don't, you might be living someone else's life. And I explained what I meant by that. And she said, well, what does it matter if I'm happy? And I said, well, maybe happiness isn't the proper test of our life at which time I knew I'd lost her forever. <laughs> um, and the look of puzzlement was, well, of course, the meaning of life is happiness. Right? And I actually, I don't think so. Uh, Jung's point here is he said, personhood often takes a, per place to a, 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 takes a person to a place of suffering. Uh, think of all the great religious leaders, the great artists from whom we've learned the most. Their life hasn't been easy. I would rather say that, that, that what we find meaningful, inherently confirmed as meaningful, is a far better test of, of what our vocation is. And that our comfort and our satisfaction is, is not the test of that. Because that's an ego concern, understandably, but it's not necessarily the concern of the soul. It's not necessarily the um, intentionality of the gods who sent us here. And so vocation is always paying attention to the notion of what is summoning you, what is calling you to some sort of developmental path. Now, um, the problem is, even if we consciously resist this, our psyche knows, because there's a paradox here. The psyche is never silent, never inactive, never not speaking. If a person comes into therapy, it's not just to have a chat. They just weren't in the neighborhood. They are there because they're, they're suffering some symptomatology. Behavioral, affective, dream life, relational, whatever the arena. And the symptomatology has come autonomously. In other words, it, it has a life and a will outside that of consciousness. And if the individual could, through the powers of conscious choice, or the reinstitution of previous strategies, eliminate it, then that individual would never have walked through the door in the first place. One only walks through that door feeling a sense of frustration or failure with regard to whatever the presenting problem may be. And yet the paradox is, of course, the very presence of what we would call symptomatology is to be welcomed. It's the sign of the psyche's activity, its vitality, its expressivity, its concern, its investment, its involvement in everyday life. Most of our psychological approaches, behaviorism, cognitive psychology, psychopharmacology, have one goal, and that is the elimination of symptomatology, which is understandable. But you realize how that may flow in the direction against the intentionality of the psyche. 
because the question, what does the symptom mean? Why has it come to us? What is the psyche's intention here? What is its agenda? Those questions get brushed aside. And very seldom are they ever really seriously preserved. And therefore, there's a certain kind of trivialization that occurs to the soul of the individual in these other modalities. And I'm not criticizing them. I think they're valuable and useful in the limited way in which they're useful. But as they've gained such sovereignty over the whole American psyche, you realize that there's this trivialization of the, uh, of the human spirit, which is ultimately not in the interest of health, not in the interest of meaning, not in the interest of growth and development. It's in the interest of insurance companies. Right? Other than that, I have no opinion. So the paradox is we can run as far as we wish but the psyche knows, and it's always speaking, and it's always expressing itself. And sometimes, even if we've fooled ourselves, then you could be sure that our partners are carrying what we're running from, or our children are carrying the burden of the unlived life into the next generation. Jung said once, the greatest burden the child must carry is the unlived life of the parent. That's kind of um, challenging little scary. By unlived life, he means whatever that person failed to address or failed to develop in his or her life, which is much, of course. And then it gets rolled over into the next generation where there's a tendency to what? Repetition? Or trying to compensate for that? Or trying to find a treatment plan for that? So the paradox is that this individuation of which you've heard is not a selfish act. It's not narcissism, it's not self-absorption, it's actually a form of service. Service to one's family, to one's children, to one's community. Because in the humbling process, it obliges each of us to try to pay attention more to an inner agenda, which is developmental, rather than the external agenda, which is typically regressive. Now, in addition to those seven questions, I'd like to mention just four other ideas, all of them paradoxes, because great ideas are paradoxical. An important idea, it, it means that the opposite is also true in some way. All of these come from, from Jung, surprise, um, whose radicality, I think, is not yet discovered. I, I think Jung, with all of his flaws as a human being, and with the many um, areas of thought which he would correct today if he'd lived another 50 years. Nonetheless, there's so much there that I think very few people have ever uh, plumbed it. Here are just some ideas from, from Jung that I do think have a bearing on this notion of creating a life. The first is when an outer situation, sorry, when an inner situation is not made conscious, it has a tendency to happen outside of us as fate. That's a very scary thought. What I don't know about myself is going to start playing its way out in the outer world. That's why I said one of the ways to find out what's happening inside of us is to start examining, start analyzing the outer world, say, what's happening out there? Where is that coming from, from in me? Now, some examples of this, where the inner situation is not conscious. Three examples leftover developmental needs that we have not addressed will tend to create a certain frame of reference through which we choose our partners based on what is unaddressed in our lives and not what is inherently there. And we'll subsequently have a tendency to burden or even sabotage that relationship. But that's a very troubling thought too, isn't it? And you realize then the best thing we could ever do for a relationship is to bring a more developed person to the table in that relationship. Or certain wounds in life with which we've identified, we're, we're wound identified as it were, tend to fixate our growth and limit the imaginative range of choices from which we um, you know, conduct our life. 
or perhaps we have, as have so many around us, identified with the artifacts of our culture, materialism, success, and yet find ourselves, even when we've achieved these things, more and more disassociated from ourselves, more and more unhappy, having a greater and greater sense of dis-ease about them. So what is not addressed inwardly has a tendency to start playing its way out in the outer world. Secondly, Jung said, most encounters with the self will be felt as a defeat for the ego. Read his chapter on confrontation with the unconscious in Memories, Dreams, and Reflections. And you'll see how over and over as he was going through his own personal analysis, he's saying, here's another thing I didn't know about myself. Here's another thing I didn't know about myself. And it felt like a defeat. He says those sentences over and over. And yet, in that, you see, is the invitation to an opening of consciousness. What is it that I don't know about myself? That is the beginning of my wisdom. An example. Many years ago, in one of the shortest analyses in history, uh, a young person came to me, young being 29 or 30, he decided to stop working in the car business and was going to go to um, seminary and become a, a, a clergyman. And he thought insight into himself might be a good idea, so I agreed that that might be a good idea. And in our first session, we talked about his motives, and one that came to the surface was, well, it will please my parents. We thought, well, that might be great when you're eight, but when you're 28, is that really an adult decision? And so I said, think about that, and watch your dreams. Second session he came back with uh, a dream in which he had been involved in a kind of nefarious scheme to control and manipulate people with someone whom he didn't know well but he knew from a distance and a person he despised. And of course the ego wants to distance itself like, you know, look at this villain in this dream. And I said, but the dream shows the two of you in league with each other. What could this be trying to suggest? It was like the scales fell off his eyes and he saw that that manipulative side of his own personality was what was really leading him into this direction. So he's going to move from trying to get people to buy cars to getting them to buy religious values. But underneath was that shadow issue. And then he said, and this is a direct quote, I never forgot it. And he got up and walked out. He said, I can't go to seminary. He said, I'm going to go to law school because everybody knows what bastards they are. Yeah. Now, there was the invitation. Now, maybe many years later, I've long lost track with this person, of course. Maybe years later, he came back to, to look at that and realize if a person's going to work with the soul of others, then he does indeed need to know these things about his own personality. But at the time, it was a shattering uh, revelation. And one, rather than just reject, he chose to identify with it. The third point, Jung said, it's not I that create myself. He said, rather, I'm happening to myself. Well, that's sort of gnomic and aphoristic and paradoxical. I think what Jung is suggesting there is once again the way the ego tends to privilege its own position when all the while something is trying to live through us. The ego tends to nominate and think of the self as an, as an object. You think of the self as a, as a noun. In fact, the self is a verb. The self is selving. Something is moving through us all the time. Enters at birth, animates this short existence, <clears throat> and departs at death with its own agenda and with its own intentionality. And you can see there that the task is, is not for ego to dominate and control that, but to live in harmony with that. That's sort of been the idea of all the great world religions, it seems to me. And, and, and yet, the notion that something is trying to live through me can feel as a defeat for the ego. It can also reposition that ego in the context of the large, that largeness I was alluding to a while ago. Also, fourth idea, and this all has to do with the issue of creating a life. Can we or can we not? He says, Jung writes, just as a person still is what he always was, so 
He always is what he will become. Hence, it's quite possible for the ego to be made into an object and for a more compendious personality to emerge in the course of development and take the ego into its service. It's a very interesting metaphor there, more compendious personality, that the ego is called into service to the large somehow. Now, th this is troubling because, again, the ego says, I want to be able to create my life according to these priorities and produce a measure of security and um, ac affirmation and so forth. And, and what Jung is suggesting here is sometimes the ego needs to be subsumed into a larger sense of reality. And when that happens, and you can see that that is found in, again, all the great religious traditions, the, the great artists who at some point had to surrender their own personal needs and comforts to the vision that was trying to come through them, and that became their gift to each of us. So the task is always to develop a more compendious personality. And the truth is, if we're honest about this, we recognize that more often, when we grew, it came out of suffering, not out of comfort. It came out of a sense of defeat, or it came out of something that was so much larger that, that it brushed. It came out of a sense of defeat, or it came out of something that was so much larger that, that it brushed aside our previous understandings of self and world. And I mean by this only that under those circumstances, the ego or conscious life is stretched, pulled into a larger vision. When that happens, truly life is, is um, in service to the gods. Now, there are a couple of examples I wanted to cite before, as we conclude, and then we'll have a chance to talk, that creating a life is possible in various ways and impossible in other ways. I believe very strongly in will. I think will sometimes, you know, melts the mountain. I believe very strongly in intentionality. If we focus and, and direct our energies, it will often take us to places where we need to go. I believe very strongly in the uh, capacity to, to make a commitment to something even in the face of being frightened or, or insecure by it. And, and one of the chief uh, representatives of that point of view we can find in the 19th century, still an heroic era in the writing, for example, of Thoreau. Thoreau writes in Walden, I learned by this experiment that if one advances confidently in the directions of his dreams and endeavors to live the life which he imagined, he will meet with a success unimagined in common hours. If you've built castles in the air, your work need not be lost. That is where they should be. Now put foundations under them. Well, there's something in us that responds to that. It's the, it's the heroic impulse. And I think that's very valuable and very important. And at the same time, you know, Thoreau's writing in the 1840s. And we have a far deeper appreciation after the horrors of modern civilization, after the discovery of unconscious uh, biological, social, and psychological determinants in our lives, how easy it is for the heroic ego to be self-deluding and perpetuate madness rather than civilization. So this is not to criticize Thoreau. I admire him. I'm just saying that we can't afford the naivete of the heroic ego alone. We have to recognize the humbling task of the ego, which is to, to be obliged to learn what it needs to learn. The other passage that I would share from a person who has thought a lot about this are the concluding paragraphs of Memories, Dreams, and Reflections by Jung. Notice the t tone here. This is where he's really in his 80s looking back on his life. And in that book, by the way, if you've read it, you know, and if you haven't, you should, uh, he never really talks about all the famous people he, he knew or met. He doesn't really talk about all his accomplishments. It's really about what happened inwardly, how did I experience it, what were my reflections, what did I learn from that, where did it take me to the next place. It's, it's more of an internal biography. So he's looking at the um, course of his life 
from a synoptic point of view. And notice the paradoxes throughout. I am satisfied with the course my life has taken. It has been bountiful and has given me a great deal. How could I ever have expected so much? Nothing but unexpected things kept happening to me. Much might have been different if I myself had been different, but it was as it had to be, for all came about because I am as I am. Many things worked out as I planned them, but that did not always prove of benefit to me. But almost everything developed naturally and by destiny. I regret many follies which sprang from my obstinacy, but without that trait, I would seldom have reached my goals. And so I'm disappointed and not disappointed. I am disappointed with people and disappointed with myself. I have learned amazing things from people and have accomplished more than I expected of myself. I cannot form any final judgment because the phenomenon of life and the phenomenon of humanity are too vast. The older I have become, the less I have understood or had insight into or known about myself. I am astonished, disappointed, pleased with myself. I am distressed, depressed, rapturous. I am all these things at once and cannot add up the sum. I am incapable of determining ultimate worth or worthlessness. I have no judgment about myself or my life. There is nothing I'm quite sure about. I have no definite convictions, not about anything really. I know only that I was born and exist, and it seems to me that I have been carried along. I exist on the foundation of something I do not know. In spite of all uncertainties, I feel a solidity underlying my existence and a continuity in my mode of being. Now, you sense there a much deeper sense of the dualities than you do in Thoreau. And you also sense the tremendous humility in Jung and his sense of being struck by the ultimate mystery of things. This person who had more to say about the mystery of the human soul than anybody I know in the 20th century says, basically, I, I don't know anything about it, which is an amazing confession and at the same time, I think, profoundly true. And so what one senses in Jung here is that the devotion of the life to this process has been inherently rewarding, but the rewards cannot be counted upon in the way in which the ego would have framed it as a young person. No doubt when he set off to marry one person over the other person, career A over career B, etc., etc., the fantasy was that the ego will be making the right choices and will lead to certain places which we will find desirable. But by the end of his life, we, we see him recognizing he says, there's something that's been carrying me all this time. I don't know what it is, but it's been carrying me. And there has been a continuity in the mode of my being. Those are his words. Those sentences to me suggest this is a person who's been very deeply connected to the life of the spirit, deeply connected to the energy that courses through all of us. And perhaps that's the best that we can do in terms of uh, creating our lives and, and living our lives. The last selection is a poem by um, Stanley Kunitz called The Layers. And the reason I like this is he too, the last I knew Stanley Kunitz was about 96 or 97 years old, still living and still writing. I hope he's still living today. And he was as recently as last year. Uh, the Layers is the title of the poem. And by layers, he means levels at which we live at the same time. I've walked through many lives, some of them my own, and I am not who I was, though some principle of being abides from which I struggle not to stray. When I look behind as I am compelled to look before I gather strength to proceed on my journey, I see the milestones dwindling toward the horizon and the slow fires trailing from the abandoned campsites over which the scavenger angels wheel on heavy wings. Oh, I have made myself a tribe out of my true affections, and my tribe is scattered. How shall the heart be reconciled to its feast of losses? In a rising wind, the manic dust of my friends, those who fell upon the, along the way, bitterly stings my face. Yet I turn, I turn, 
exulting somewhat with my will intact to go wherever I need to go. And every stone on the road becomes precious to me. In my darkest night when the moon was covered and I roamed through wreckage, a nimbus clouded voice directed me, live in the layers, not on the litter. Though I lack the art to decipher it, no doubt the next chapter in my book of transformations is already written, for I am not yet done with my changes. Okay, let's take a break. Ten minutes, is that what you normally do? Ten minutes, and then we'll come back and talk. Thank you. Houston, and then flight delays, and then flew to Austin, and then to Phoenix, and finally to San Diego. And then rush hour and two hour time difference, so it's a long day. As always, great questions come up in the um, interim, and let me try to respond to some that I recall, and then it will be an opportunity for the rest of you. W one question I just want, I do want to follow up briefly on tomorrow. I really don't care if you don't want to come at 8 o'clock, just be here, right? <laughs> Nobody wants to be here at 8 o'clock, right? But that's the time we have available, and it could be important to you. And um, again, bring some, something to write on. And what I want to do is talk about Jung's idea of complexes, which everybody thinks they know about. But I want to talk about them in some ways that I think are very practical, very useful. And secondly, to talk about the um, way that the two categories of life's wounding the overwhelming of life and the uh, abandonment of life. Now, it's all, all of our wounds come from those two kinds of uh, things with a thousand variations. For each of them, there are three personality strategies that are possible, and we all have adopted all six of them in the course of our life. And all of them are at work at points in our life, so what I'd like to do is bring them to the surface and talk about how these six patterns play out in our life. And one may prevail at any given moment in one's life, and, and one may, in fact, become a life pattern, the central pattern of one's coping with reality. And, and then I have 20 questions for you. Uh, and the purpose of those questions is to um, provoke some reflection on your part and some um, um, thought. The word analysis doesn't mean to slice up, as in the sense of analytic reason. It means literally to stir up from below as you'd stir up a bowl of soup and the vegetables come to the surface. So the purpose of the questions is to stir the material of the unconscious and bring some um, uh, stuff to the surface so that we can make it conscious and reflect upon it. Now, there were several questions. I'll try to remember. Middle life is a chronological category. One could typically call it today anywhere between 30 and 60, perhaps. I preferred to call it the middle passage. Uh, and the reason for that was that I found people, no matter what their age, and I only see basically people in their 40s and older, by and large, not so much by choice, that's just the way it works out. Those are the kinds of emanations I send out, I guess. And um, I found that, ver that every person was facing a similar dynamic, and I alluded to it very briefly. Each person was bumping up against the limitations of his or her understanding of the world, who I am, how I am to function, what strategies and what values I'm to be devoted to. It wasn't saying that the values of one's past were wrong, it was just saying they didn't make sense the way they used to or the strategies that helped, had been appropriate to another time and place were, were not to this one. And so something was ending, something was being exhausted, and before entering therapy, each person had understandably tried to reinstitute the old values and the strategies more intensely, and whatever the problem was got only more problematic. Um, and or sought help and advice from a number of different sources. And secondly, that there was something that was dying. In some case, it could be a naivete. 
It could be another st an earlier stage of life. It could be this old agenda. And something else hadn't yet been born. And that the person was there in a sense of in-betweenness. But the in-betweenness was of indefinite length. And one couldn't necessarily predict where the other would come from. So I began to reflect, well, this, this is really a rite of passage then, isn't it? The one, you know, there's birth and death. Those are the obvious ones. And then, then there's the adolescent passage where we move from the overt dependency of, of childhood into this proto-adulthood that's supposed to be the real deal. And later we find out, you know, we didn't know who we were or what we were doing, which is very humbling. Um, and so I began to think of it as a middle passage, namely a passage between the adolescent passage and our mortality. Now, I began to realize also that the middle passage wasn't tied to midlife chronologically. It didn't, didn't just dawn the day you were 35 or 40. That in many cases, people put it off a very long time. That for some people, for example, it would come when there was a terminal diagnosis. For some people, it came when their spouse died. For some people, it was precipitated by the last child going off to college or the army or marriage or whatever. For some, it came as a result of retirement or being downsized. For some, it came as a result of aging. For some, it came without any outer elements whatsoever, but it was simply there one day. And, and it wasn't so much the precipitating dynamic as the fact that it caused one to raise very large questions and begin to ask questions like, who am I apart from the life I've led? That is to say, who am I apart from my history? Who am I apart from my roles? Who am I apart from the agenda that I'm serving? And, and you know, maybe part of that agenda is earning a living, um, raising one's children, being a citizen, so forth. And, and that whatever had been the understanding of that question before proved to be inadequate to the present circumstances for reasons that were not clear. So in thinking about the middle passage, I realized I couldn't tie it to any specific time in the person's life. But when it really became a conscious thing that forced a different kind of questioning, that that person entered the second half of life. And that's not a chronological point, it's a psychological point, a fulcrum. And that sometimes people were in their 60s or 70s or 80s when that occurred. So to me, the category of middle age is almost meaningless. Middle compared to what? When I was young, 60 was very old. Today, it doesn't look so old. Um, because of our ex life extension and our psychological changes. So the, the middle passage really is um, whenever the instinctual self, the self with which we were born, bumps up, up against the floorboards of the provisional self, the one we had to acquire, and its knocking can no longer be denied. And one is obliged to say, what's going on here? And as long as one asks the question honestly and continues to ask it, it, it changes one's psychology, changes one's relationship to oneself and to the world. And I think the middle passage in that regard is the opportunity to get oneself back again. I mean that because, as I implied before, all of us have to make adaptations to whatever the society demands around us, most particularly the family of origin. And our survival and uh, nutrient needs are, are, are obliging us to do this. But you see, the more the adaptation, the more the potential estrangement from one's own nature. And therefore, the greater the divergence inside, what historically was called neurosis, which is an ugly term and a useless term because it's not neurological. It's simply a split agenda. 
we're serving two agendas, and the gap between them grows to the point that it finally forces itself upon consciousness. And I think the child knows that, but the child has no point of reference. You know, how do I judge that apart from the field that I'm in? And secondly, I don't have the powers to enact that in any case. And therefore, it gets pushed underground, and the young person leaves home thinking, I have a big body now, I'm separated from my parents, I'm walking into the world and to undertaking big tasks and big roles, and therefore I'm a, I'm a big person. I'm a psychologically achieved adult. And, that, and then we begin to look at that and see it as the first adulthood. The first adulthood that uh, may be very productive, maybe not, that's another matter, but it's swarming with those unconscious ideas that I was alluding to. It's swarming with those autonomous complexes from family of origin particularly and from culture. And as a result of which, again, repetition, compensation, or a treatment plan, or a combination of the above. And therefore one sort of stumbles into the second half of life having achieved uh, a, a de facto personality, uh, a sense of self, sense of other, and how we reflexively relate to each other. And if one were dumb lucky, and that adaptation were consonant with one's own nature, one would not suffer the split. In most cases, that doesn't prove to be true. And so the second half of life then you see, and again, not speaking chronologically as much as psychologically, is an opportunity to get something of oneself back again. As one begins to say, all right, now, what is it that's coming from within me? I was asked also what books would be useful with regard to these subjects, and I'm not here to sell books, really. I make a dollar twenty a book, so if every one of you bought them, I, I'm not going to retire on that. But the three books that would most speak to this would be The Middle Passage, and then secondly, Creating a Life, because Creating a Life is sort of The Middle Passage 15 years later, son of Middle Passage, if you will. <laughs> Dracula and Middle Passage, right? Um, Middle Passage goes to the beach, whatever. <laughs> um, it, it, it's um, saying all that was true in Middle Passage and, this is much more difficult than we thought, folks. And then the last book that just came out in November is um, On This Journey We Call Our Life. And it's organized around 10, ten life questions, ranging for, what, for how do I discern my shadow to um, how do I deal with mortality and small questions like that. Yeah. And if they're not here at the Friends of Young, you can get them on Amazon. Now, the, the other question, of course, that came up was how do, how do I begin to discern or differentiate between the necessary adaptive provisional personality structure and the natural self? And the truth is we only begin that process when it starts hurting. Because if it didn't hurt a little bit, we would just ride easy in the saddle and stay on cruise control. That's why the paradox is, rather than suppress suffering and suppress symptomatology, a depth psychological point of view asks, what is the psyche saying here? Why is it protesting? What is its agenda? And if I can discern more about that, then I can begin to live in a more harmonious way with my own destiny. As I had mentioned very early tonight, the, the distinct, our culture tends to confuse fate and destiny. They're really quite opposing force fields. Fate is, again, all that the gods give us. Your, your genetics, your family of origin, your culture, aspects of your um, temperament, what the Greeks would have called character. And yet there are infinite variables there, infinite possibilities of choice. And destiny is that which the organism is seeking to become. The famous analogy, cliche now, the acorn has in it the oak tree. Every acorn has an oak tree. Doesn't mean every acorn becomes an oak tree. There are all kinds of forces of fate and otherwise. The difference where the analogy fails is there's no consciousness apparently in the, in the acorn. There is with us. So there would be the chance for the acorn to change its course. 
even though we, like the acorn, can be blown away by the forces of fate. So if you think about destiny as that which the organism intends to become, the reason for its doing so lies wholly beyond our understanding. That lies wholly within the realm of divinity. You may have a theory about it, but that's, at best, that's what it is. And secondly, what it intends to become may have very little to do with what you would like. And thirdly, what it intends may have very little to do with what is approved by your culture or your tradition. And you can see how the ego caught between that warping set of agendas can get very twisted and, and actually be its own oppressor as it understandably seeks consensus, security, comfort, satiety. Those are not crimes, but when they are the goal, one may very well be furthering one's own self-alienation. The people we most admire in history are typically people who wound up in a place other than their ego had intended, and at some point surrendered to that or lived it out. Why do we admire them? Um, I think basically because they became, uh, because their becoming brought something to the world. And each of us, I think, is supposed to do that. That would be my presumption, that each of us is supposed to do that. Not in a way that necessarily receives public acclaim, but in a way that serves the purposes of the universe, whatever they may be. Anything that thwarts that is a violation of that purposefulness. Um, you, can, you can speculate on its purpose, certainly. But I think one could say, then, that the uh, ego's task would be to align itself with its own deeper nature, and in so doing, be in service to the universe. Um, I think it was Merton who said, we're, we're all people who've been sent here from a foreign country with a message from a king, and we're supposed to deliver that message. But here we are running and scurrying around and bumping into each other, having forgotten that we're couriers with a message, that we were sent by a king, and that there's a reason for our being here. And that's our dilemma. I hope that summarized some of the questions you ask. Uh, other thoughts or comments now? One, because that's an archetypal dramatization of that which is a summons to destiny and the ego's understanding, well, I'm going to run and flee that. I'll get as far from that as I can. So let's say we run from ourselves, and what can happen to us? Well, we can suffer a huge depression and have no clue as to its origins or what, what it's about which would be being swallowed by the whale. So let's say that a depression, a person has achieved the goals that he or she set out and then is afflicted with a depression. Um, and, and Jung talks about the therapeutic value of the depression. Now, we're not talking about a biologically based depression. That's a biochemical process, which is like diabetes. You treat diabetes, you treat depression. We're talking about an intrapsychic depression a different animal. And um, the therapeutic value of depression would be asking what has been fled, what has been ignored in the conduct of one's life. And that the bottom of the well into which one sinks in depression, there, there, there's always a bottom. And the bottom is always a starting point wherein there's a task, and the task is to address what is missing in one's life or in one's personality or what one's left behind or what was oppressed. For example, most of us don't have permission to be who we are. So if we're not being who we are because of insufficient permission to do so, we're going to have a depression, whether it's diagnosed or not. Because the more that the psyche, excuse me, the ego wishes to invest in a certain direction, 
And, and the more inimical that is to the intention of the psyche, the more the psyche is going to autonomously withdraw that energy and produce a depression. So all people have pockets of depression, but would not be diagnosed as depressed. Pockets of depression have to do with the places where our souls are wounded, places where our life is not being lived. And I don't think there's any way we can avoid that. I think that's just part of the human condition. So the Jonah and the whale story would be an example of um, the effort to flee the self using its strictly psychological language. And the summons of God in, in the biblical imagery would be the summons of personhood, the vo vocation of which Jung was talking about. Um, one might also say that the um, archetypal story of Job is another example. Um, jo Job, by definition, is a good person, and yet the world is dumped on his head. And you can say, well, this is um, very offensive to my sense of fair play and morality and so forth. And, and, and um, you have to ask, well, what's this book about? It's 5th century BCE. And um, what it's about is an unknown Hebrew poet borrowing a story from the ancient Near East and um, using it in a poem to critique the tradition of his own tribe. And in this tradition was the notion of a contract, a compact, an agreement, a covenant. And the presumption upon the covenant or contract was, if I do the right thing, the party of the first part will do the right thing too. Right? Now, unbeknownst to people, you realize the presumptive nature of that? To put it in theological language, do you force God to sign a contract? Can we say that my behaviors will evoke a reciprocal response from the universe? Well, we'd like to think so, but that's a form of magical thinking. That's common to children, primitives, and all of us in our moments of stress. Right? And so what this work does is critiques that attitude. And the comforters who show up, this is a trivia question, Bildad, Eliphaz, and Zophar, right? Each of them say, basically, Job, there is a deal here we have with God. And since God's obviously displeased with you or apparently displeased with you, you know, you must have violated the contract and so forth and so on. In the end, the comforters are rebuked by God, who makes a late appearance in the, in the story. And Job has an interesting sentence there. Because as a young person, I was always offended by this book. I thought, well, God, you just bring out the heavy battalions and, you know, crush poor little Job. And that was my heroic ego, you see, reacting. And in later years, I came to realize the key sentence there is where Job says, I have heard of thee with mine ears, but now I see of thee with mine eyes. Now, we have to understand that metaphorically, because the Hebrew would never say, I see you, God, because that would be making God an object, and that would be blasphemous. So metaphorically saying, I, I have received a tradition, and as a result of which I've been pious, and as a result of which I was presumptive. But now I see the complexity of the universe, and that there is a plane of reality that completely transcends my ego understanding and my ego control and my ego's agenda to map out a predictable contract with it. Now, this is a very short version of Job, believe me, but what you can see there is an archetypal drama again in which the ego is being repositioned in relationship to the large. So I said earlier, beware of have, asking for a religious experience, you might get one. And if you get one, you see, it throws the ego into a cocktail. You know? Jung actually wrote in a uh, letter to Valentine Brook in about 1953 or something like that. He said, I call God that which flings itself violently across my path and for good or ill um, alters my conscious intentions. Now, you're never going to see that in a work of theology. But what he was saying was that whenever the ego is 
dramatically overthrown or repositioned, it's then placed in proper relationship to the large, and that he would call a religious experience. Doesn't mean that's pleasant. It means that it causes the ego to completely reframe its sense of reality and to enlarge its sense of reality. So I would say that the capacity to make the middle passage conscious has a religious dimension to it because it causes the ego to reposition itself from the understandable and I'm perhaps necessary youthful fantasy of heroic sovereignty, sovereignty over the world and to find itself placed in the larger context of mystery. And that that's typically felt as a defeat for the ego. But from that, as Jung said, the self is made manifest. These are large issues, aren't they? Here we are in Southern California. Large issues. Yes. Question. I think every day requires the reading of one's world psychologically. And I put reading in quotes, which I'm sure you could see. I, I, I'm supposed to re re repeat that question. How do we go about searching for meaning and so forth? Because uh, this is being taped here. Um, the reading of one's world means that all events have a psychological dimension of which we may be unconscious. I touched on this briefly in talking, and I know I laid out so much that it was hard to um, assimilate it all and, and follow out the tracks. But, for example, whenever something moves us, we ask the question, what has been hit in me? What has been activated in me? What is it, where does that come from? Where have I been here before? What does that feel like? Um, and what's, that, what's the message of that old experience? If, in fact, it's hitting, let's say, a complex. Uh, there's a, an Allison I have right now who, whenever she really starts talking in a certain way, invariably starts weeping. And when she starts weeping, I know she's having an incredible vision of herself. She weeps uh, autonomously, I mean, without decision to do so, when she recovers a larger view of herself. Now, that's a felt experience. That's a bodily experience. It's a behavioral experience. I also have another now, and if you can see, whenever she starts to say something really personal, which you sort of do in analysis, she would do one of two things, put her hand in front of her mouth or her hand in front of her throat. Both of these are self-censoring motions. This went on for a couple of years. I pointed it out, continue to go on now, she literally catches that before it, ha it gets up to the face. Now in both cases, what we're seeing here are enormous clues to one's personality that are in everyday behaviors. I'm sure the second individual is self-censoring, has been most of her life. And, and even in that gesture, one senses, here is my truth, which I am now throttling. Here is my truth, which I will not let you hear. Now that child wasn't born that way, that was learned. And it's, talk is cheap. It's not easy today to say, I will learn to speak my truth. I will not put my hand in front of my mouth anymore. Um, and yet that's the task, you see. So I, I think the um, reading of one's daily life requires becoming psychological. And that's not easy. Becoming psychological means what's going on here really, what's going on inside of me, what's going on in the other person, 
what's going on between us. Now, that's not an easy thing to answer necessarily, but one thing I could say is everything that ever happens is eminently logical. It may look to you as if it's crazy, but it's not crazy if you understand the emotional perception from which it comes. That the way another person behaves is always logical if we understand the emotional premise out of which they're operating, and they may not even know it themselves. What we have done is coming out of emotional premise too. The premise may be inaccurate, may be tied to childhood, may be a misperception, but it's been deeply housed within us for so long that it ceased to be a conscious thing, it's become a reflexive response. One of the things I find daunting is how much of our life is on automatic pilot. And the automatic pilot means that we could theoretically live this, you know, three score and ten and never have been here. And never have been conscious and still maybe have been productive in the world by the world standards. Because the, the degree of reflectivity is not there. So I, I think it starts with a um, willingness to commit to a certain attitude, to ask what's going on here really, to start reading the world psychologically, and then to make it a discipline which happens um, every day. We can't be psychological in every moment. It ha life happens too quickly. Too much is reflexive. And um, yet there ought to be some point in every day when one reflects on the conduct of the day. Marian Woodman wrote in one of her books that she asks a person to spend an hour, if they begin therapy, spend an hour every day in personal reflection. Could be working on their dreams, could be a, a journal, could be meditation, but really working on themselves. And she said, so many people say, well, I don't have time for that. And then she says, you don't have time for analysis then. Until you're ready to be serious, you're not ready for this. So the question would be, are we serious about our life? Are we willing to make any kind of commitment to um, trying to create a life, to, to live it more consciously? Now, I, I, the one thing I've not wanted to do here is delude you. I, I hope you appreciate the largeness of this, the majesty of this, and the difficulty of this. There are no easy steps to the conduct of one's life. It, it's, a, um, it's a daily labor. But what, what is worth the conduct of your life? Um, those are healthy questions. And yesterday's answer is not sufficient for today because it keeps changing. You know, it changes as we, as, as our agenda changes, as our developmental process changes. Yeah. Meditation. I, I, to me, the key issue of meditation is do we keep an appointment with ourselves? You see, each of us is invited to appointment with ourselves and many never show up. And, and the key in meditation to me is to show up and be present to yourself and it ought to be, again, a daily practice. And the form doesn't matter as long as one is willing to truly be present. Now, interestingly enough, we live in a culture whose chief virtue is its capacity to distract us from ourselves. That's why it's there. In the 17th century, sorry, the 16th century, no, 17th century, Blaise Pascal said that modern culture was a vast divertissement diversion designed to keep one from thinking of self because if you said he said this is the 17th century if you think of self you will grow disturbed so ours is a culture that's terrified of loneliness and therefore we spend our lives avoiding ourselves you see the flight from loneliness means the flight from oneself and it's been observed that the cure for loneliness is solitude Solitude means that when you're alone, you're not alone because you're present to something. Call it God, call it the Tao, call it the self, it doesn't matter to me. Um, you're present. And the interesting thing is, if you can tolerate the silences, um, 
something manifests always. Wonderful um, talk Jung gave in 1939 called The Symbolic Life, and it's uh, housed in the volume 17 of the collected works titled The Symbolic Life, among other papers and talks and so forth. It was given to the Guild for Pastoral Psychology in London just before the beginning of the war. And he said, humankind ill tolerates a vacuum, and therefore it it will drift to um, centers of ideological gravitational pull. And he said, in our time, the world's dividing to the, the right and fascism and the left and communism. And, and uh, ideologies, in the end, will never do anything other than annihilate the soul. But he said there's a third group of people who've internalized this struggle as neurosis. And he said the future belongs to the neurotic, meaning those who, have, who are suffering, rather than r- running to the ideology to, to flee their appointment with themselves. And then he goes on to talk about how difficult it is for us to be present to the self in our time and how we've lost the so-called spiritual practices of, of our uh, ancestors. And he said one of the things that our ancestors knew is that if you wait upon the silence, it is not silent. And when you wait upon the darkness, it is luminous. And the only way you're going to find that out is to do that. And he felt that that was the, the antidote for the modern who didn't fit in to the old categories and the old traditions, but also wanted to live a life of integrity and not be submerged into the mass ideologies. Yeah, one more question. Yeah. Comments. Um, I think that Stanley Kunitz poem that I read was speaking about surveying one's history and saying, you know, even now transformations are occurring and the next chapter is already being written. 